our brain will misfire and misinterpret things and that's kind of a bummer. However, this is sort of the cool side effect of having such a highly evolved nervous system and brain. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for coming back if you've been here before or hi, welcome if you're new. My name is Mickey, I'm a therapist and we talk about therapy things on this channel. Today we are talking about horror movies. Um, this is not a thing that I personally actually really enjoy, but I do find the psychology behind horror movies fascinating. So we're talking about that today, both because uh, selfishly I wanna talk about it and also because it's spooky season, so it felt appropriate. So the phenomenon of horror generally is especially interesting to the internet. I am not the only person to find this interesting. There's actually a lot of uh, research and discourse about this. So I'm excited to talk about it, especially because like on its face, horror is a thing that we as a culture should really not enjoy as much as we do. Um, in theory, we should be repulsed um, by this media that's intended to make us feel afraid. Um, except that in 2020, horror actually had a record breaking year. So uh, clearly it's popular. We're continuing to flock to it in droves. Um, and so I'm excited to talk about why. Uh, before we talk about why we enjoy it though, I do wanna, uh, uh, level set, set some um, groundwork about what horror is specifically, um, and then also explain how it works and like how it affects our brains. So let's get into that. So in terms of uh, what actually is horror, this is a thing that's at the subject of a lot of debate actually. Um, there are a lot of people with uh, actually very contentious opinions about <laughs> what horror is specifically, or like what the genre should be allowed to include. For the purposes of today's video, uh, we're talking about a genre that encompasses a variety of media that is intended to disturb most of the time if not always includes some element of like evil or depravity so again I just want to be clear there are lots of like sub genres of horror we're not necessarily going to get lost in the weeds about that today essentially we are talking about media in this case film that is specifically designed to simulate danger uh, for the purposes of uh, provoking a fear reaction in the audience there is something from one of the studies that I wanted to read to you because I thought it was interesting I'm just going to read you the quote because they uh, put it really succinctly. They defined horror as media that is intended to elicit fear consistently and deliberately rather than sporadically or incidentally, which I think is interesting, again, because the genre is sort of unique in the way that it operates, but also in how sophisticated um, it actually is. A lot of people actually um, talk about horror as like a sort of like shitty hack media <laughs> that's like not very good and whatever, um, but actually the way that horror manipulates the audience is quite sophisticated. Um, it really genuinely is a full body and mind experience um, and horror also is noteworthy because of its very effective use of sound um, and score in particular. We're not gonna get into that. I'll talk about that maybe a little bit later. Generally, for the purposes of today's video, we're talking about media that's intended to create distress and that essentially is exposing you to like traumatizing stimulus. We can uh, verify this in the research, by the way. There are some fascinating studies. I will spare you the details of them, but there are some fascinating studies that have reliably reproduced this phenomenon um, of the audience being affected almost immediately. First of all, the effects of horror um, can be seen seen in the audience in about one to two seconds after being introduced to the stimulus, but also um, we can verify that it's both a physical and a psychological phenomenon. For what it's worth, the freeze response was the number one, uh, like most common response indicated by the audiences, which is uh, noteworthy in my opinion, but that's what we're talking about today. Oh, also before we move on, I also wanna make a quick distinction. Um, we are not necessarily discussing true crime today. I think there's like a Venn diagram here of like some horror films being based in true crime stories, but we're not necessarily talking about true crime as a phenomenon. In my opinion, that's a whole separate thing. That's a whole separate phenomenon and a whole different impact or interaction rather with the brain. Um, so we're not necessarily talking about that today. We may talk about that um, at another time. So stay tuned for that. But this is not that. Okay, so when we talk about what horror actually does to our brains, I think it's important to start with uh, understanding the way that our brain interacts with media generally, right? Okay, before we get into that, I do wanna pause and say thank you to this week's sponsor, which is Beducated. I'm so excited to partner with Beducated again. We've partnered with them in the past and I genuinely am just such a fangirl of the service. For those of you who don't know, Beducated is an online platform that's dedicated to pleasure-based sexual learning. Beducated has over 100 plus online courses from the world's top experts. It's also a wonderfully inclusive platform as a non-binary and queer person. I feel very represented and safe on the platform. I recently took Beducated's course about female orgasm and as a vulva owner, despite feeling like somewhat advanced, I would say, in my own sexual learning journey, um, the course actually had a lot of interesting and useful feedback. I learned a lot about the different types of uh, vulva orgasm. And there was also some really good suggestions for integrating the use of sex toys, both in your sex life with yourself and your sex life with partners. One of my other favorite things about Beducated is that the content is explicit without feeling pornographic. 
Personally, I need specific instructions about things to feel like I'm learning effectively, but it doesn't feel good to have content that's like objectifying. And I think Beducated lands this perfect balance of being specific enough to actually give you real actionable advice without feeling objectifying. The thing about Beducated that I just really love is that it feels like such a wonderful and safe place to learn, especially for folks who are like unsure about these questions that you're like, where do I ask these? Beducated is the perfect place to learn about that. Like I said, I'm just genuinely a fangirl of the service and I think everyone should have access to it. So I'm especially excited because Beducated hooked me up with a discount code for all of you. Go click the link in the description and use my code Mickey Atkins to get 40% off of the yearly pass. Beducated also has a one day free trial and a 14 day money back guarantee. So genuinely there's no risk involved. So go click the link in the description to get your 40% off the annual pass and show Beducated some love for showing me some love. Thank you so much to Beducated for sponsoring this week's video. Let's go ahead and hop back in. There's a really interesting article. There's lots of things that are gonna be linked in the description today, but one of them is a really interesting article about the way that our brain interprets movies generally. It's important to remember that our brain's primary function is survival, right? Like from an evolutionary perspective, that's the whole point of the thing. And so when we talk about how we interpret media, it's important to remember that our brain's primary purpose is to continue existing, right? Surviving. This is also why we can be so emotionally affected by film and like media generally, um, because the industry has evolved to better manipulate our psychology. This is kind of interesting to me personally that the industry has evolved in this way because essentially they've learned how to better play games with our biology and our minds in order to put butts in seats. That's a whole, we're not gonna get into my personal thoughts about media and the industry at large, but like generally speaking, I wanna encourage people to remember the way that we interpret and this case horror is very much informed by the fact that our brain is not really intended to be doing that. Our brain is interpreting a like modern phenomenon through this very archaic lens. And so that informs the way that our body and like our minds respond to stuff like horror. So I wanna talk to you guys about what your brain actually does uh, when we consume horror movies. Um, it's important to remember that when we talk about this psychological phenomenon, we're essentially analyzing the way that your brain responds to trauma. Um, I don't know that we've made a dedicated video about the way that your brain responds to trauma. Maybe I'll write that down and we can talk about that eventually. But I wanna give you a simplified explanation of how your brain <laughs> responds to danger and trauma because that's quite literally what's happening to you when you're watching a horror movie. So there are three main players that we need to be aware of. I'm gonna try and give you guys diagrams so this is a slightly less boring. We all know that I think this is fascinating. I'm gonna try to give you diagrams so it's slightly less boring, but there's three main players that we need to be aware of. First and foremost, the amygdala, the hippocampus, um, and the hypothalamus. These are our three brain structures that we're gonna talk about today. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through like exactly what happens here. So when we talk about a normal trauma response or like a trauma response to an actual traumatizing, real, physical, psychological ego danger, what happens essentially is that we receive sensory input. For example, a serial killer standing in front of you with a knife, that activates your amygdala. Your amygdala is this almond shaped thing at the very center of your brain. It's essentially, people refer to it as the reptile brain sometimes. It's like the most primitive part of your brain. This is a simplified explanation, but its only purpose really is to keep you alive. And so it's sort of like the alarm system, that like when something bad happens, it's like, oh my God. So that part of your brain activates first. And the thing that is informed next is your hippocampus. Your hippocampus campus is responsible for things like memory storage. It's responsible for a whole bunch of other shit. But again, for the purpose of this very simplified explanation, your hippocampus is responsible for memory storage and it helps to contextualize the danger that you're experiencing. So for example, it will respond or, or contextualize, like if a serial killer is standing in front of you with a knife, as opposed to like your friend standing in front of you with a pretzel rod, your brain interprets those two things as very different. They may like physically appear to be somewhat similar, but the hippocampus is the thing that helps us remember, for example, um, that like sharp instruments are dangerous, right? As opposed to like your friend with a pretzel rod just being like fun snack time, right? So your hippocampus helps to contextualize whatever threat you're being presented with. And then your hypothalamus uh, is like your control room. Oh, that's right, parent. Ah, look out! When we talk about like responding to threats and stuff like that, people oftentimes talk about the release of, I almost said neurotoxins, neurotransmitters. Uh, the hypothalamus is the thing that's responsible for neurotransmitters and things like that. It's commonly the subject of discussion when we talk about depression, because if you're not releasing the right neurotransmitters, then you can feel bad. In this scenario, your hypothalamus is the control room that helps to maintain a thing called homeostasis. Um, if you're not aware, homeostasis is the process by which our body maintains like sameness. For example, our body temperature, this is my favorite example of this. It doesn't matter if you're standing outside in 100 degree heat or like it's negative 12 degrees outside, um, your body will still maintain this consistent ish 
temperature, that's a product of homeostasis. That's a product of your hypothalamus being like, all of our insides only work if we're at this somewhat stable temperature. So um, the hypothalamus is the thing that helps release neurotransmitters and like respond to the information that the hippocampus has given it. So in this example, if a serial killer is standing in front of you, your hippocampus says, wow, that seems dangerous. And your hypothalamus says, push 10 of epi, oh my God, we need to get out of here. Basically uh, your brain releases like adrenaline and some other stuff. But also what <laughs> happens is that your breathing increases um, so that your lungs expand and so that your, your blood is flooded with more oxygen, which makes you feel more energized. And it also, um, it speeds up your heart and your blood pressure rises, which are all helpful things when we talk about either fleeing or fighting, but it also floods your bloodstream um, with fats and sugar, which serve as a temporary like energy bomb to help you get ready to fuck shit up. The way that our brain responds to threats is fascinating. It's actually quite sophisticated. I think it's super interesting um, that there's this very specific process that's designed to either help you like cut a bitch or like run away. And so in a, like a normal example, this is like a simplified version of what happens essentially. For people, this is oftentimes at the moment that you would experience the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response. It activates structures in your brain that essentially like neurotransmitters allow your Bible your Bible, your brain to bypass your normal physical self out of survival instinct. This is why we see the phenomenon of like moms being able to lift a car off their baby um, or people being able to run, like especially the um, 127 hours thing, that guy who chopped off his own leg or something. Is it his arm? He chopped off his arm, sorry. He chopped off his own arm. That response is a thing that's informed by this physiological response that your brain has. It allows you to bypass your normal physical limitations so that you can try to survive even if you survive somewhat maimed, right? The fascinating thing about this is that our brains are not so simple as to have this predetermined reaction to a perceived threat. Your brain is actually quite sophisticated in the way that it responds to these things. And so when we're watching horror, the response is like similar, but it's different enough to mean that we can watch a horror movie and actually kind of enjoy it. So I'm gonna, again, simplified explanation, explain to you what your brain does when you're watching a horror movie as opposed to being faced with a real serial killer. Okay, so like I mentioned, this response is somewhat different when we're actually watching a horror movie as opposed to experiencing a real threat, which is the thing that I think is so fascinating about this whole thing. So um, again, a simplified explanation of what happens to your brain is as follows. When you experience distressing sensory input in the form of like, for example, seeing a serial killer on a movie screen, this does still activate your amygdala. So that survival part of your brain is still like eh, eh. however your hippocampus because it's responsible for contextualizing this information will go mm, skeptical i don't think that's a real person because i know that i've watched a movie before for example or i've watched a horror movie or i know that these types of things exist in this world so mm, i don't think that that's actually a real serial killer and i don't think that we actually have to fear for our physical like survival danger and so this prompts your hypothalamus to say okay listen here's the thing i'm going to dole out a situationally situationally appropriate amount of neurotransmitters and hormones like adrenaline just in case because your hypothalamus is still kind of like mm, on the off chance that this is real let me goose the works here a little bit just in case we do actually have to run for things but this results in an inhibited fear response that's still scary but it's like fun scary uh for what it's worth the process here is not unlike what we experience when we get on a roller coaster or we do other like thrill seeking types of things your brain is able to conceptualize essentially that like i know i'm strapped into this roller coaster seat and this is probably safe however on the off chance that like, for example, this roller coaster fails, um, I'm still gonna pump some adrenaline. I'm still gonna give you a temporary hit to your system with like, uh, again, the fats, the sugars to your bloodstream. Um, it's gonna increase your respiration rate. It's gonna increase your blood pressure and your heart rate just in case we do need to make a run for it or like bypass, for example, our physical limitations to survive, but it doesn't do it in quite the pronounced way that it does when we're faced with actual danger. The other thing about this that really cracks me up is that essentially what's happening is that we as a species have figured out how to effectively play games with our survival instinct. I feel like this is just such an interesting thing that like we as a species experience boredom and like a need for stimulation in such a way that we as an industry, as a culture, as a collective have figured out how can we simulate the response like I'm gonna die, except I'm not actually gonna die. And we're like literally playing games with our psychology. Personally, I think this is fascinating. I tell my clients all the time that having such a highly evolved piece of technology essentially in our our skulls is kind of a drag sometimes because this does mean that we experience things like mental illness, for example. Our brain will misfire and misinterpret things and that's kind of a bummer. However, this is sort of the cool side effect of having such a highly evolved nervous system 
system and brain um, that were able to like effectively play games with this like electrified meat sack in your skull and <laughs> create this physical response in your body that feels really good despite the fact that it's supposed to be like an emergency protocol. Okay, so in answering the question, why do we then enjoy this then? I've sort of answered this a little bit already, but generally speaking, um, like I said, this is not unlike the response that we experience when we're on a roller coaster or we do other like thrill seeking things. Essentially, we are figuring out a way to activate this emergency protocol because we think it's funny and because our brain is able to contextualize the information enough to limit our emergency protocol <laughs> response so that we're still experiencing the adrenaline rush and the, so the subsequent come down of that without feeling like we're actually in danger. The other thing I wanted to note about this is that while there are some interesting demographic features um, in terms of who seems to enjoy horror the most. Um, I also want to make the distinction here that liking horror movies and like thrill-seeking experiences generally doesn't mean that you're a bad person, right? There can be like this stigma attached to people who enjoy things like horror movies um, as being like weirdos or people who are like particularly prone to violence especially, and this is not necessarily true. Being a person who enjoys having this simulated fear response doesn't make you bad, right? Essentially what we're talking about is enjoying the adrenaline rush and this is like a pretty universally agreed upon thing people just really enjoy the experience of having adrenaline flood your nervous system because it's fun there is again uh, we're not necessarily going to get into the science of like the actual come down effect that's a little bit that's a little bit lost in the sauce in my opinion um but the the feeling of resolution that we get after experiencing this um adrenaline high it's very normal, it's very human, it doesn't make you a bad person. I also want to talk a little bit about some of the other reasons that we potentially enjoy horror movies though, because our biological response is not the only reason that we find this enjoyable or fun. There's a lot of interesting theories about this. We're gonna cover a couple of them. The first of which being excitation transfer theory. Um, this isn't super well supported in the research, but it is like the most common thing cited when people ask the question of like, why do we enjoy this thing? So I wanted to talk about it anyways, but just as a disclaimer. It's not necessarily um, the most evidence-based phenomenon, um, but we do have some research to support the, the truth of this. While I pull up my notes for this, by the way, I wanted to give you guys a quick reminder to go get your 40% off your annual pass with Beducated. The link for that is in the description and you can use my code Mickey Adkins to do it. Excitation transfer theory is essentially the theory that the emotion that we experience from any given phenomenon or, or stimulus will be heightened if we experience an emotional experience before that. I know that this sounds sort of convoluted. Let me simplify. We talked earlier about the feeling of resolution that we get after experiencing this adrenaline high, and this is kind of similar to that. Essentially, this theory posits that the more distress and anxiety that we experience in anticipation to the resolve, um, the greater feeling of relief we'll have when the conflict eventually resolves itself. Personally, I think this is super interesting, especially when we talk about like the story arc that exists in a lot of horror movies. Um, for example, in Stranger Things, when um, you know they close the portal at the end, the feeling of of relief that we get when that happens is heightened spoilers, I guess, because they killed off uh, Joyce's boyfriend, Bob. That like deep emotional pain that all of us felt when he died um, heightened the feeling of resolution that we got at the end of it. There was this feeling of like, oh God, thank fuck. Like no more of our favorite people are going to die. Um, and so like that feeling of closure and relief that we get, excitation uh, transfer theory posits that that feeling of relief is heightened because of the anxiety that we experienced beforehand. This is why I said like, it's not necessarily supported in the research, but I wanted to talk about it, A, because people endlessly discuss it in regards to this phenomenon, but B, because like logically, I think this makes sense to a lot of people, right? Um, feeling a greater sense of resolve after feeling anxiety is a pretty well um, understood and like respected phenomenon for a lot of us. Um, it makes sense that we would feel, um, especially in context for horror, a greater sense of relief if we've watched like characters that we love and enjoy experience trauma at the end of this when like the serial killer is arrested or there's like justice brought or there's like some kind of answer to this problem, of course it makes sense that we would experience like a greater feeling of relief. Another thing that's noteworthy about why we enjoy horror is the phenomenon of sensation seeking, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, there is a quote that I think is really interesting here, um, or somebody phrased this probably more succinctly than I can, so I'm just gonna read you the quote. It says, sensation seeking is the seeking of varied novel, complex, and intense sensations and experiences, and the willingness to take physical, social, legal, and financial risks for the sake of such experiences. Um, this is a pretty open and shut, like the thrill seeker thing. For what it's worth, there are people who have a greater um, 
propensity for being <laughs> sensation seekers, particularly people who are uh, vulnerable to boredom. Interest in thrill-seeking behaviors is correlated with people who have a greater likelihood to experience boredom without their lives. So for what it's worth, if you are uh, neurodivergent or have ADHD, you might be a person who finds thrill-seeking and like adrenaline high activities um, to be a particular source of fascination for you. Or if you do, this might be why. Another thing that I thought was interesting um, in regards to this question of like, why do we enjoy this um, is a thing that is discussed ad nauseum in all of the research and also the articles written about like, why do we like horror movies? Um, it's this thing called a protective framework. Again, I want to be super clear, this is not necessarily the most evidence-based or like reliably produced phenomenon in like gold standard research. However, it's worth noting because we're going to talk later about uh, trauma and mental illness in regards to this. Um, so I wanted to mention it here. Protective framework essentially refers to three different uh, frameworks that in theory a person needs to possess in order to enjoy horror. Obviously, not everybody actually enjoys horror movies. Um, and so if you are a person who finds horror uh, particularly repugnant or like not your thing, um, this might be relevant to you. So uh, the three frameworks are, first of all, the safety framework. Um, essentially, we need to feel physically safe and protected in our immediate environment. The detachment frame, meaning that we need to be able to effectively detach ourselves from the media and recognize it as nothing more than media that is, um, you know, being performed by actors. It's not real. It's not happening to us. Um, and it's also not happening in real life. And also the protective frame, which is a confidence uh, that we can control and manage real life dangers. The reason that I think this is noteworthy is because especially if you are a PTSD, CPTSD survivor, all of these things will probably sound familiar to you. Uh, if you experienced trauma, um, especially in childhood, but like generally speaking, if you've experienced a pretty noteworthy trauma, you might not have that underlying belief, especially about being able to control and manage real life dangers. Being subjected to a life-changing trauma will do a number on your nervous system and your brain and can cause you to feel this sense of unease and like danger about the world and relationships generally. This can result in hypervigilance and all this stuff. This video is not about PTSD, you get it. However, uh, this is noteworthy because for people who have this merging of things, right? Like a trauma history that causes you to feel unsafe in the world um, and also a dislike of horror, those two things might actually be correlated. It can be difficult for us to enjoy media that's intended to provoke fear and to disturb us, to activate essentially our emergency protocol when, first of all, um, you don't have a feeling of safety about the world. And also if your brain tends to activate your emergency protocol more often, then this experience is not novel to you and it's also not enjoyable to you. Again, we're going to talk more about mental illness and PTSD in regards to horror later, but I wanted to note that here because I think it's really, really interesting when we talk about like this distinction between people who are like avid uh, horror consumers and people who find it just like, ugh, like not their thing. The other uh, thing that's noteworthy about why people seem to enjoy horror so much is a thing that applies to media generally. Um, collective anxiety tends to create this need for catharsis. This is why I mentioned earlier that horror had a record-breaking year in 2020, in my opinion, um, and in the opinion of a lot of other people on the internet. Um, it's not a coincidence that a year that was um, wrought with a lot of social, medical anxiety for people meant then that we were seeking catharsis in the form of, uh, you know, this type of media. We as a culture tend to gravitate towards escapism during times of unrest and uncertainty. This is a, a thing that's commonly cited in regards to the Great Depression, that movies and, and cinema had um, a burst in popularity around that time as well. It's a culturally and, and societally uh, approved of way for us to seek an escape from our current reality, especially again, when it's um, anxiety inducing or uncomfortable, immersing ourselves in this made up world can be a way for us to find temporary release. The other, I think, obvious reason about why we enjoy horror um, is just like the general morbid curiosity that we <laughs> as a species tend to have. It's not a coincidence that we tend to find ourselves drawn to conversations and depictions of things that are just oftentimes not discussed. The uh, phenomenon of death has been a subject of fascination for the human race 
sprawl of fucking time. So in my opinion, it's also uh, noteworthy here um, in asking this question. Like, of course, we find the subject of death and the macabre interesting because A, it's not a thing that's commonly discussed, but B, it's a thing that's of particular fascination for people whose brains and nervous systems are wired for survival. Of course, we're interested in the topic of like why a particular person died or like the details of that. It's something that to a degree we're almost like hardwired to have an interest in. One last thing that I wanted to note here though is that there are some problematic demographics um, associated with particularly high levels of enjoyment in horror. This is why I made the disclaimer earlier that liking horror generally doesn't make you a bad person. However, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the demographic features that came up in doing research for this video. The first of which is that people who had higher scores on assessments for manipulation and issues with power and control tend to be correlated with a higher enjoyment in horror. The other thing that is noteworthy here is that there is a difference. Um, the, the studies only evaluated sex-based differences using binary terms. So I just want to be clear, sex and gender is not a binary, but for the purposes of um, accurately representing what the studies found, um, there was a correlation between the who the studies identified as male and a greater enjoyment in horror. The other thing about this that was like a little bit worrying, those who are identified by the studies as being male were correlated with higher levels of enjoyment in horror and particularly in graphic and violent depictions of horror. That, again, I want to make the disclaimer that you don't necessarily, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. However, again, I feel like I'd be remiss to not address this, especially because there's an interesting conversation to be had. Again, I want to make the distinction that liking horror doesn't necessarily make you a bad person. But personally, again, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about this, um, especially because there was a positive correlation meaning when one thing increases, the other thing also increases. Um, there was a positive correlation between the consumption of violent and graphic porn and the enjoyment of violent and graphic horror movies, um, and especially in identifying with the serial killers and like perpetrators of evil in horror movies. So like, that's a whole conversation to have about victimization and especially about the misogyny and the violence that, um, you know, people identified as female often experience. And so like, that's, Again, that's why I said earlier, there's some interesting demographic features that are associated with this. That's potentially a thing to be mindful of for what it's worth. Again, I stand by the disclaimer that not all people who like horror are bad people, obviously, um, but there are some interesting correlations that again, they feel important to talk about. I think it goes without saying that not everybody actually enjoys horror. Um, and so I do want to talk about that also as a person who um, myself finds horror to be uh, particularly fucking off-putting. Um, I think this is especially interesting. So I want to talk about some of the correlations that we know from the research about why people might not enjoy horror movies also. We briefly mentioned this earlier, but those who were identified by the researchers as female were statistically less likely to enjoy horror movies. Again, we sort of already talked about this, but especially in regards to the conversation about victimization, I think that's especially interesting, particularly in regards to the films that do depict violence and like graphic crimes against women. Um, it's not surprising, in, to, in my opinion, um, that people who were identified by the studies as female would tend to enjoy those types of films less. The other thing that is really interesting about this conversation of like, who who doesn't enjoy horror is the conversation of empathy. One of the things that was found in the research again and again and again is that those who score higher on empathy assessments tend to enjoy horror less. Essentially, uh, this is to say that those who have a much more uh, natural inclination to put themselves in the shoes of others and to experience um, themselves the suffering of other people, I don't think it's a surprise that you would be less drawn to types of media that depict violence and suffering. Again, this is not to say that people who enjoy horror movies have like clinically low <laughs> levels of experience with empathy. It's just that for those who especially have a heightened sense of empathy, watching a um, film like this is going to make it harder for you to distance yourself. We talked earlier about the protective framework thing. Um, for those of us who have a heightened sense of empathy, it will be more difficult and will probably require a more conscious effort for you to detach from the media and therefore actually enjoy it as nothing more than media. We also touched on the topic of CPTSD and clinical anxiety earlier. And again, in terms of this conversation of like who is less likely to enjoy horror movies, this demographic is somewhat of an obvious one. Enjoyment in horror is kind of predicated on this belief that your nervous system, your sympathetic nervous system and your hippocampus has effectively learned from and processed traumatic experiences in the past um, and like therefore um, distanced yourself so that you can actually en engage with simulated danger more effectively. And so 
for those of us who are actively still working through processing, for example, traumatic experiences around our physical safety, you're just going to have a harder time effectively detaching from the media like we talked about so that your body and your nervous system don't experience it as though it's happening in real time. For those of you who are not aware, trauma affects the brain in such a way that it can make it difficult for you to distance yourself from the traumatic memories. So when you're confronted with a trigger, your hippocampus reacts in the same way that it did while that event was happening, which then stimulates your hypothalamus to release all of the things that it released in the throes of that traumatic event. This is why when we're triggered, it feels like we're being traumatized right now in present moment. And that's why it's so incredibly dysregulating. So for people who are trying to watch a horror movie, if you have trauma around your bodily safety or around relationships or like the world just being an unsafe place and your hippocampus has not effectively processed that yet, ideally through the use of psychotherapy and other evidence-based mediums, then your brain will respond to simulated danger as if it's actual danger, which isn't fucking fun for obvious fucking reasons. We talked earlier about how the very sophisticated response of your brain is the thing that allows us to enjoy simulated danger. And so again, if your brain hasn't done that work, first of all, this doesn't make you a bad person. We're all on our own journeys to do our own work, but also just be mindful of that, be aware of that, um, and also be nice to yourself. People especially kind of have like this hateful energy of like, if you don't like horror, you're a bummer. That's not true. You're allowed as a person who has a very hard time with horror movies. They're like genuinely so fucking disturbing, <laughs> dysregulating for me that it's like a hard line. I cannot watch them. Please know from, <laughs> from one person who struggles with it to another that you're not a bummer, that you are allowed, that spooky season can be just as fun watching a uh, cool, good, happy, fun times <laughs> movies. Um, and that folks who like horror can just like horror and like have their own, watch parties of their own horror movies. You're not a bummer. You're not being sad. Your brain is actively conspiring against you <laughs> from enjoying this type of media and that's not your fault. The other thing that's noteworthy here is uh, trauma in childhood. Being traumatized in childhood in regards to horror specifically can very much be a reason that you don't like horror as an adult. There are actually real studies that support um, how children can be traumatized by being exposed to horror too early in their life. Kids who are exposed to horror at an inappropriate age can be more likely to develop uh, clinical anxiety and sleep disorders, um, as well as violent uh, to others or self-endangering behaviors. Don't freak out though if you're a parent. Your kid happening to see a horror movie doesn't mean that they're like destined to be traumatized. One of the things that's commonly repeated in therapisty communities about trauma is that the difference between a kid who just experiences disturbing stimuli and goes on to process it effectively and a kid who experiences disturbing stimuli and is traumatized is whether they have the opportunity to process that with safe people. One of the things that we know about childhood trauma is that your ability to feel safe and supported with the adults in your life can make a whole hell of a lot of difference in your ability to process that and like effectively put it behind you. So do be careful obviously about exposing your kids to fucking horror when they're very small. However, if your child accidentally happens upon this or they see it at a sleepover or whatever, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be traumatized for life. Just do your best to show up for them and to give them space to process and to work through emotionally what's happening for them. In summary, horror generally is just a fascinating phenomenon in my opinion. There's a lot of really interesting uh, psychology underpinning its success, despite the fact that it's regarded as sort of like the lowbrow stepchild of the cinema world. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting thought and like intention that's gone into making the genre as compelling as it is. For what it's worth, we didn't even get into this, but I will link a thing in the description if you guys want to read about this. Um, horror is commonly regarded as being the most effective uh, genre to use um, sound and music to create anticipatory anxiety in its audience, which makes the simulated danger payoff even more heightened. So again, generally speaking, if you are a person who enjoys horror, know that that doesn't make you a bad person. You are perfectly allowed. And there are like very real psychological <laughs> reasons why you and your body and your nervous system probably enjoy it. Uh, as much as you do. Along with that though, if you are not a horror girly, <laughs> don't feel bad about that also. Um, there are very real psychological reasons why horror might feel bad. And so give yourself full permission to decline the invite to that movie night if you need to. Sometimes people are just traumatized or have too high of an empathy threshold apparently um, to effectively enjoy horror. So, you know, you're allowed. I guess all of that to say, I hope that you guys have a wonderful and fabulous spooky season and a good Halloween if you celebrate it. Just practice doing the things that are safe and feel okay for you and your body and your nervous system. Also, if you guys like the video, like the video. You can subscribe to the channel. We do talk about stuff like this, but we also talk about a fun educational moment every now and again. So I'd love to have you stay for that and then share the video to help the channel grow and to help each other grow. And I will see you guys next Saturday. Okay, bye.